The British voted for Brexit about five years ago. Now the consequences are becoming visible. The exit from the EU made the United Kingdom poorer and stabilized the EU and the remaining 27 states. Five years ago, Europe was briefly in shock. Immediately after the British voted with a narrow majority in favor of leaving the EU on June 23, 2016, the British market fell into severe turmoil. The pound collapsed. On the continent, two worries were arrived as to whether a British crisis would affect the economy on this side of the English Channel, and much worse, whether other countries could follow the UK and also leave the EU. None of these risks occurred. On the other hand, there is hardly any evidence that their supposed freedom has given the British an economic advantage. What is the balance after five years and what lessons can the UK and the EU learn from these difficult times? Let's first look at the numbers. The Brexit referendum has thrown the UK into almost unprecedented political turmoil, but not into a recession. Instead, the British have acquired a certain amount of weak growth. The damage is particularly evident in corporate investments. From the referendum to the onset of the pandemic, companies in Great Britain stopped increasing their investments. If they had instead maintained the pre-referendum momentum, investment would have increased 21% by the end of 2019. That's a big difference. Roughly speaking, British economic output would have been 4% higher at the end of 2019 if the British had decided in favor of the EU five years ago. So far, nothing speaks against the forecast of the magazine Capital from the year 2016 that even a contractually halfway regulated Brexit would reduce the British trend growth from 2.1% to about 1.6%. This means that the very flexible and in many areas well-regulated country falls from one of the top positions in Europe to the upper midfield. The economic consequences for Germany and the EU are minor. On the one hand, our exports to Great Britain are weakening. On the other hand, there is a small increase in jobs as some companies have relocated some jobs from the island to the continent. And other companies are now increasingly looking for partners in other EU countries instead of in Great Britain. As a sales market for German goods, the country has dropped from third to sixth place. For the first time, Poland is now ahead of the United Kingdom for us. From a political point of view, Brexit stabilized rather than shook the union of the now 27 EU countries. The British turmoil with years of turmoil over the exit agreement have shown one thing above all. Divorce hurts, especially for the much smaller partner. Before the divorce petition, the British side had apparently not even considered how they would envisage future relations with their largest trading partner by far. In the negotiations on mutual market access after Brexit, the EU played out its size so consistently that it could almost be called brutal. With the strength of the EU at its back, Little Ireland was able to de facto dictate the conditions for Northern Ireland's economic status to the British. In order to avoid a land border on the Irish island, Northern Ireland remains in many areas in the EU's internal market. This demonstration of strength of the EU and its solidarity with a small member country, Ireland, has taught some EU skeptics elsewhere otherwise. Since in addition, with all the occasional grumbling about Brussels, Frankfurt and Berlin, neither French nor Italians want their pensions and wages to be paid in a new weak currency instead of in euros. Even the notorious right-wing populists on the continent have largely abandoned the proposal to the EU to withdraw from the EU or the Euro. Above all, the EU can learn one lesson from this experience. If it can bring itself to a common position and play to its economic strength, it can achieve a great deal in relations with other countries and at the same time promote its own cohesion. Although both sides have ratified the treaty on their future relations and Great Britain left the EU internal market at the beginning of a year in a more or less orderly manner, the Brexit turmoil is far from over. The agreement on trade in goods without tariffs and import quotas is not bad as such, but the new border formalities, for example regarding the origin and the technical standards of the goods, make life difficult for small British companies in particular. In the area of services, which is important for London, the British are ultimately dependent on the goodwill of the EU as to whether and to what extent Brussels recognizes British standards and regulations as equivalent. That hasn't really happened so far. Northern Ireland's special status can also cause disputes time and again. After the British side unilaterally extended a transitional arrangement and thus obviously broke the wording of the contract with the EU, the EU has already threatened countermeasures 
in accordance with the treaty, including punitive tariffs. Even if this conflict can be diffused again, what now happened with an extension just until September, it shows that trade between Great Britain and the EU can repeatedly be burdened by new disputes and the risk of a trade war. Companies that value planning security will be reluctant to do so. In other words, there is still a lot of sand in the gears. Unlike in the EU, Brexit has strengthened centrifugal forces within the UK. In June 2016, only the English voted by a majority to leave. The Scots, Northern Irish and even the Welsh, and I don't mean the English in Wales, the Welsh were against it. In Northern Ireland, the dispute over the province's special economic status and over the import controls for English grilled sausages, which can actually only be delivered to the region of the kingdom that remains in the EU internal market, has already led to unrest. Since the Catholic Northern Irish, thanks to their higher birth rate, will soon make up the majority of the population, the likelihood has increased that Northern Ireland could join Ireland within a generation. In the north of the kingdom, Brexit has further increased the aversion of many Scots to the union with England. Still, the likelihood of a break with England and the entry of an independent Scotland into the EU has tended to decrease. On the one hand, the EU has lost some of its reputation with a bumpy start to the vaccination campaign. This has nothing to do with Brexit. Even within the EU, the British could have designed their vaccination strategy themselves as this is not one of the contractually agreed tasks of Brussels. But the public impression is devastating. The fact that the British owe their vaccination success above all to the EU, which exports vaccines generously, while initially the USA and Great Britain kept all the vaccine doses produced in their own country for themselves, is hardly recognized across the English Channel. In the long run, however, Another argument is likely to prevent a majority of Scots from leaving the United Kingdom. Scottish membership in the EU would require a land border between Scotland and England. Trade between these two closely related nations would be severely disrupted. The theatre around Northern Ireland would only be a taste of possible consequences. In this sense, paradoxically, the economically unsatisfactory situation for Great Britain at the borders with the EU has probably reduced the risk of the country falling apart. This is not really any real consolation for Great Britain. The bottom line is clear. Brexit has not paid off. On the contrary. But life goes on. I'll see you in my next video. Auf Wiedersehen.